Hi again. We're in the last chapter now of A.T. Robertson's The Divinity of Christ in the Gospel of John. The chapter is entitled The Vindication, dealing with chapters 20 and 21 of the Gospel. The resurrection of Jesus from the grave is the basal fact in the revival of hope in the disciples, and on this fact rests the claim of Jesus to be the Messiah and Savior. He had repeatedly foretold his resurrection on the third day. This promise vanished with all the rest in the wreck caused by his death. The disciples themselves forget all the consolations held out by Jesus so often, and in particular on the night before his death. The gloom of despair settled upon their hearts. The task of the risen Christ is to convince his own disciples that he is again alive, and that the kingdom of God has a future. He had been unable to get them to see that his kingdom was spiritual, and they took his death as the end of their hope of the political kingdom which they still look for. Here, of course, Robertson is, is dealing with, his, with, with the kingdom from his peculiar eschatology, which, the es which is the eschatology that dominated in the days when Robertson was a young man, amillennialism and postmillennialism. So is there no room for a what he calls here a political kingdom in the future? Well, that's for another day. He goes on, the difficulty was very great, as we can see, but the first problem is the restoration of faith and hope. The disciples were now all skeptics and pessimists, and the Gospels all show this to be true. The accounts vary in many details concerning the appearances of Jesus, but they give only fragmentary records of these days. They all insist on the great fact that Jesus has risen from the now empty grave and is alive and has appeared to his disciples. Their independence strengthens their witness. Modern doubt scouts the possibility of resurrection of the body on scientific grounds, and all sorts of theories exist to explain away the actual resurrection of the body of Jesus, like the swooning of his body, the nervous fantasy of the women, the psychic appearance of the soul or the aura of Jesus, the invention of the story because the disciples wanted it, in other words, wishful thinking. But no one of them explains the revival of faith in the minds of these discouraged men and women. Christianity is a fact, the greatest fact of history. Paul and the Gospel writers explain the origin of Christianity as a religion on the ground of the resurrection of Jesus, in confirmation of his great claims to be the Son of God, the Savior of men. This interpretation has stood the test of time and holds today as the only adequate explanation of the power of Christianity in the lives of men. John recounts from his own experience just those incidents which called out in the disciples the fullness of belief triumphant over personal sorrow and common fear and individual doubt. That last sentence is from B.F. Westcott. Now the first visit of Mary Magdalene to the tomb that is chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. John does not speak of the visit of the women to see the sepulcher late on the Sabbath, just before sundown, the dawn of the first day, as Matthew does, nor of the purchase of the spices after sundown, as Mark does in Mark 16, verse 1. He makes no allusion to the other women, as Mark also does, who come with Mary Magdalene to the tomb early while it is yet dark when they start though the sun is risen when they reach the sepulchre. He is simply interested in her part, that is Mary Magdalene's part, in the great event, and passes by the rest. It is probable, at any rate, that she ran on ahead of the other women. Was, was that because she was younger? Seems to be also the case with Peter and John. It's probable, at any rate, that she ran on ahead of the other women when they see the stone taken away from the tomb. This of itself is cause enough for wonder. Without waiting to look inside, she runs, therefore, and comes to Simon Peter, back again with the beloved disciple, and John with her hasty interpretation of the grave robbery, unspeakable shame, and calling for the courage and skill of men to find the body of Jesus before it is further dishonored. All this runs through the mind of Mary in a flash and she acts upon the impulse of the moment. The enemies of Christ have even tried to show dis despite to his corpse. In saying, we know not, Mary implies the presence of the other women with her. So as Robertson plainly says here, the, the discrepancies seeming in the accounts don't, don't indicate any kind of collusion as to the story. This actually 
strengthens the idea when you think of it from the Jewish aspect of the Jewish standpoint of the law, which is the testimony of two or three witnesses, is is decisive in in serious issues. Well, the resurrection is agreed upon by all the Gospels, and in fact, all the 500 that Paul doesn't name but mentions were at, present at one time in 1 Corinthians 15 at one of the appearances. So the multiple attestation, rather than the the unanimity of their testimony about details, the multipl multiplicity of attestation is is the real, I think, as Robertson says here, is the real proof that the early church did not conspire to put this story together. I'll put in a link to uh, meditation that we did on Paul's statement in Romans 1 verse 4 that Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. The, the apologetic and the gospel of the early church was the resurrection, not the Bible. So when we think of it that way, we of course are struck by the fact that we've changed our tactics. We Protestants anyway over the centuries have changed to defending Bible first. The resurrection is still of course insisted upon, that is that it was a bodily a bodily resurrection and that it was witnessed by eyewitnesses but the apologetic shift this subtle shift to the defense of the bible is of course not the approach of the early church it certainly wasn't the approach of paul and john so i'll put in the, a, a link to what the apostles creed says about the difference between what some people think of as unity which is actually uni uniformity and true Christian unity. The churches of the first three centuries were united on these central facts that are now embodied in the Apostles' Creed that goes back at least to around 400 AD. So our discussion of the Apostles' Creed, unity versus uniformity. The whole church to this day, the, the larger churches of Christendom, all believe in the resurrection of the body, which is very clearly stated in the Apostles' Creed. See you soon.